This is a place of death and great bravery, and one of the greatest human stories in the world. It is the Roman Amphitheater in Carthage, near the modern city of Tunis in North Africa. There's not much left now, but over 1800 years ago, it was a place of bloodthirsty excitement. Usually the crowd came here to see gladiators killing wild animals. It was a dangerous sport. The gladiators also fought each other, sometimes to the death. One day, the evidence points to March the 7th, in the year 203 after Christ, when the amphitheater was full to capacity, the people witnessed something truly amazing and shocking. Two women, one from a rich and privileged family, the other a slave girl, entered the arena. And later that day, as they faced death, they held hands as sisters would. This is their story. The true story of Perpetua and Felicitas, two of the bravest women North Africa or the world has ever seen. Carthage was one of the most vital cities in the ancient world. It was the capital city of the Roman province of Africa Proconsularis. The area was rich in harvests of grain and olives, and these were exported across the Mediterranean to Rome. Most of the people worshipped the gods and goddesses of ancient Rome and some of their local gods, but there was a minority who were Christians and absolutely refused to acknowledge these gods, and sometimes they died for their refusal. Not for any crime, not for any act against anyone or against the state of which they were loyal citizens, but simply for their personal faith in one God alone and in Jesus Christ as Lord. So who was Perpetua? And how do we know her story? Most of the information comes directly from Perpetua herself. From the time of her accusation by the Roman authorities until the day before she was to enter the arena of death, she kept a personal diary of what happened and how she felt. Some people are surprised that a woman of that time could read and write. In fact, literacy among Roman women has been proved both through ancient history and archaeology. On the walls of houses in Pompeii, over 120 years earlier, there are pictures of women holding the waxed boards and stylus pens that were used for making daily notes and keeping accounts. This picture, also from Pompeii, shows a husband and wife. The husband holds a scroll, possibly a legal document, and his wife is holding wax boards and a stylus. Clearly, both the wife and her husband wanted the artist to show them as educated and literate. So we should not be surprised that 1800 years later, we can hear the authentic voice of Perpetua. She could write, and write well. Perpetua had recently converted to Christianity. Her younger brother had also converted to Christ. They were catechumens, converts preparing for baptism. Their preparation was in the hands of a man named Satyrus. His task was to teach Perpetua and her brother and four other converts about the Christian way of life and Christian beliefs. They must have known this was dangerous. Why were they doing this? These people had been brought up to believe in many gods, but the Christian faith taught that there was only one true God and that this God 
cared for them and had revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Through faith in Christ, the wrong they had done would be forgiven. They would be changed and they would experience the power of God in their lives. This change was symbolized by the use of water in the ritual of baptism. But denying the existence of the Roman gods looked like treason to the Roman government. That same year, persecution against Christians broke out in Egypt, where many believers were executed for their faith. The persecution of Christians in Carthage seems to have been aimed specifically at those who had recently converted. Perpetua faced accusation by the Roman authorities with her fellow believers. The others included Saturninus and Secundulus, the slave girl Felicitas, and Revocatus, also a slave. Perpetua's father was not a Christian, and he just could not understand why her new faith in Christ would stop her from sacrificing to the Roman gods in honor of the emperor. You see this water jug? Can it be called by any other name than what it is? So it is for me, a Christian. Perpetua and the other Christian converts were kept in custody for several days. Satyrus, their teacher, was not arrested with them, but actually surrendered himself to the authorities in order to be with them in their ordeal. What a sacrifice. During his time, they were baptized. Then a few days later, they were taken to the prison. Perpetua describes what happened. We were taken to the dungeon and I was afraid. I have never experienced such darkness horrible day, the suffocating heat of the crowded people, the abuse of the soldiers, and then I was exhausted with anxiety for my baby. Then Tertius and Poponius, blessed deacons who ministered to us, arranged a payment for us to be let out for a time in a better part of the prison and be refreshed. I nursed the baby, who by now was weak from hunger. In my anxiety about him, I talked with my mother, and I comforted my brother, and then I managed it that my child could remain with me in the prison. Perpetua's brother had asked her to pray that God would show them whether there would be suffering or freedom, and she did. And that night, she had a vision. Perpetua, I am waiting for you, but watch that the serpent doesn't bite you. Non me non cavit, in nomine Jesu Christi. He will not harm me in the name of Jesus Christ. From under the ladder, the serpent stuck out its head, but it seemed to be afraid of her. At the top, it was like a huge garden or park. And the sound of the Amen woke her up, but the taste in her mouth was sweet. The meaning of the dream was clear. Their destination was heaven. The way would be with pain, but Satan would be defeated. Perpetua tells us that she shared the dream with her brother 
it must have been very difficult for him, more than it was for her. Then she makes a comment in her diary that from this moment on, they knew they could not look for hope in this world. The Roman province of Africa, modern-day Tunisia and part of Algeria, was normally administered by a proconsul who had previously served as consul in the Senate in Rome. But at this moment, the proconsul Minucius Opimianus had died. And until a new proconsul could be appointed, the supreme judge in Carthage was his assistant, the procurator Hilarianus. For the moment, Hilarianus had the power of life and death, and he must not be seen as soft on Christians. Rome was watching. Perpetua and the others were taken to the Forum for their trial. The others confessed their faith in Christ. Christian says? Cristiano Sum. Cristiano Sum. Cristiano Sum. Cristiano Sum. Cristiano Sum. Cristiano Sum. Infanti. Suddenly, her father appeared, and he had her baby boy. This played right into the hands of Hilarianus. If he could persuade this high-born Roman mother to return to the Roman gods, this could set an example and break the will of other Christians. Spare the grey hairs of your father. Spare your baby boy. Make the offering for the welfare of the emperors. I won't do it. Are you a Christian? I am a Christian. Have pity, daughter. Have pity on your father. Give up your pride. Don't destroy us. Hilarianus sentenced all the Christians to death. But this was not to be execution by the sword. It was death in the arena to be torn apart by wild animals to entertain the crowd. Perpetua's father had taken the baby with him, but amazingly, the child no longer cried for his mother's milk, and Perpetua suffered no pain by not having to feed him. A death sentence for Roman citizens usually required confirmation from Rome, and this took some time. When it was confirmed, Perpetua would lose her Roman citizenship and could be thrown to the beasts. Now, Perpetua tells us, the Christians were moved to a military prison. The guards in the first prison probably belonged to the city of Carthage. The guards in the second prison were Roman soldiers. Perpetua writes in her diary, a few days later, Pudens, the junior officer who was in charge of the prison, started to show us respect, recognizing the great power that was working within us, and he allowed many people to visit us so we could encourage one another. One of these visits included her father, who again pleaded with her to change her mind. Of course, it upset her emotionally. She did not want to dishonor her father and her family. But to dishonor God was unthinkable. The Christians knew they were to die in the so-called games to celebrate the birthday of Caesar Gita, the younger son of the Roman emperor, Septimius Severus. But in the meanwhile, their living conditions were harsh. And one of the group, a young man named Secundulus, died there in prison. Jesus, The senior Roman officer in Carthage was the military tribune. Like many Roman soldiers, he was tough but superstitious. There was a rumor put around that the Christians were going to use magical incantations and spells to get free and would somehow be carried off out of the prison. The tribune was unsettled. These were not like ordinary prisoners, and certainly they were not criminals. What were they? What power did they have? 
he decided not to take any chances, so he put them in the worst possible conditions. He should have known better. Perpetua got to see the Tribune. She was still a high-born Roman woman, even if she had been stripped of citizenship, and she was seething. Why will you not allow us to take care of our basic needs? We, the most famous among the condemned, isn't it evident to Caesar? And we, who will fight on his birthday? Wouldn't it be to your credit if we were brought out looking good? The Tribune knew he had made a mistake, even in political terms. The crowd expected a show, and one prisoner had already died. Now, thanks to Perpetua, the Christians would at least have better food. And something else had happened. Prudence, the non-commissioned officer in charge of the prisoners, had also come to faith in Jesus Christ. Among the prisoners was the slave girl, Felicitas, who had become pregnant before her arrest, possibly even before her conversion. She was now in her eighth month. According to Roman law, she must first give birth in the prison. After that, the mother could be thrown to the wild beasts in the arena. So perhaps Felicitas would not die with her fellow believers as a testimony to Christ, but later in the company of common criminals. She desperately wanted to avoid this. The little group of Christians joined in intense prayer. They literally groaned together as they asked God desperately that somehow Felicitas would give birth. Almost immediately after their prayer, she felt labor pains coming on her. It was hard and difficult. One of the guards was sarcastic about it. If you're suffering like this now, what are you going to do when they throw you to the animals? <laughs> you didn't think about that when you refused to make the offering, did you? Right now, I am suffering what I must. But then, then there will be someone else in me who will suffer for me because I will be suffering for him. She really suffered, but Felicitas knew that she was not alone. Christ was with her. And when very soon she would die for Christ, he would be with her then. She gave birth to a baby girl, and one of the Christian women in the church, a sister in Christ, adopted the baby as her own child. The day before the games, it was the Roman custom to give condemned prisoners one last meal before they would die in the arena a gesture of generosity from the emperor, a free meal for the prisoners before they became a free meal for the animals. The young Christians decided to make this a meal of fellowship and a time of communion. It gave them a moment to remember what Christ had done for them and how his death, his broken body and his shed blood on the cross had made them into one body of believers with his life in all of them. They were family in Christ. But the Roman tradition did not just give a free meal to the condemned. It also came with a large dose of humiliation. The public was allowed to come into the prison and stare at the people they would see in the arena the next day, a preview for those who would die when the wild animals were let loose. It was free entertainment and the Christians were just a spectacle but they did not take it lying down.
Is tomorrow not enough for you? Why is it such a pleasure for you to look at those you hate? Today you're our friends, tomorrow our enemies. We'll take good note of our faces so that you will know us when that day comes. Some of the crowd must have known something about the Christians and what they preached. That last statement from Satyrus had a double meaning. You will know us when that day comes. It could mean tomorrow at the games, but it also meant the day of judgment, when the Christians would witness the condemnation of this crowd by God. They were shaken by it and by the confidence the Christians showed when facing death. The Christians were so sure about the afterlife. The document states that the crowd left them shaken and stunned, and some of them later became Christians themselves. Perpetua had one more vision, and it was Pomponius, the deacon. Perpetua, we're waiting for you. Come. Don't be afraid. I am here with you, and I am struggling alongside you. No le espantere. Le subtengo. Et con la borde. I looked at the huge gaping crowd. And as I knew I had been condemned to the wild beasts, I was wondering why the animals were not set loose on me. Then she saw her opponent, an Egyptian wrestler. But suddenly, Perpetua herself felt that she had changed. She had the strength of a man, an athlete, a warrior, a gladiator. Then she saw the referee. Don Futamini! This Egyptian, if he defeats her, will kill her with the sword. But if she defeats him, she receives this branch. Daughter, peace be with you. Then I woke up and I understood it would not be wild beasts I would be fighting, but against the devil. But I knew the victory would be mine. So this much is what I did up to the day before the gladiators. What happens on the day of the gladiators itself, if anyone wants to, let him write about it. This is the end of Perpetua's personal account. Her diary was put into a document that included other things. In the prison, Satyrus also had a vision and kept a record of his experience. So what did happen to them the next day? This was to be a day of victory an opportunity to declare their faith in Christ and to show that belonging to him was greater than life itself. Before the day was over, they would be in heaven. When the moment came to enter the arena, they were triumphant. The Romans wanted to parade terrified victims for the crowd to gaze on, and then they would bring in the animals. But this was different. Perpetua was singing, singing a hymn. Satyrus, Revocatus, and Saturninus were warning the spectators of judgment to come. By now, the crowd was deafening. 
When they passed the Procurator, Hilarianus, they used signs to tell him, what you are doing to us, God will do to you. Before the games began, the Christians had shared among themselves how they hoped they might die in the arena. They remembered that Jesus had said, ask and you will receive. So they had prayed to die in a certain way. Satyrus hated the idea of being attacked by a bear and believed God would allow him to die with one bite from a leopard. Saturninus thought he might be attacked by several animals and that would be fine. When their turn came later, and the animals were released into the arena, Saturninus and Revocatus were first attacked by a leopard. And then they were tied to a platform and mauled by a bear. Satyrus was tethered on a leash to a wild boar, and the animal handler himself was gored by the frantic beast, and Satyrus was just dragged along the ground. The animal handler died a few days after the games. Satyrus was taken to a platform and tied up. He was to be attacked by a bear, the very thing he hated and feared most. But the bear refused to leave its cage. This whole thing is exactly what I imagined and predicted. Until now, no beast has touched me. And now, believe this with all your heart. Watch me. I'm going out there, and I will be killed with one bite from a leopard. Farewell. Keep the faith and remember me. And don't let this bother you. Let it strengthen you. This action with the ring was very significant. Spiritually, Pudens, the Roman soldier, had already joined the group of Christian believers. Among his new friends, he alone would survive this day. And his ring, his personal ring, had been dipped in the blood of his teacher, Satyrus. Satyrus was not yet dead, but they dragged him into a room and threw him among the bodies of the dead and dying. The practice was to come back later and cut their throats. The women were treated shamefully, stripped naked, then draped in nets and paraded in front of the crowd. This was too much. Even the people of Carthage protested. So the guards brought them back, dressed them in tunics to face the wild beasts. As she recovered, she realized that her hair had fallen loose. Among the Romans, a sign of mourning and grief. It was not right for a martyr to appear grieving at the moment of death. So she found her hairpin and tried to put her hair up again. Then together, hand in hand, the noble lady and the slave girl, sisters and equals together in Christ, walked back to the gate. It's done. Stand firm in the faith and all of you love one another. 
Do not stumble because of our sufferings. Perpetua and Felicitas had survived the attacks of the animals, but still they must be executed. Hilarianus, the Roman judge, had pronounced that they must be put to death. The martyrs were taken to the platform in the arena. There they exchanged the kiss of peace, a Christian tradition, and waited for death. That same year, many, many Christians died at the hands of the Romans, most of them unknown to us by name or family. But thanks to Perpetua's diary and the people who preserved it, we know the story of these true lives of North Africans who died not fighting their enemies, but standing in their faith. Later, in Carthage, a great church was built over their graves. Archaeologists identified it in Tunis in the 20th century. But more important for us is to remember the courage these people showed and to know, as they did, that this life is only part of a much greater story. So in Perpetua's own words, stand firm in the faith.